Um, morning all. Uh, yes, I'm a social scientist with a very broad interest in governance of um, coastal systems um, in uh, different parts of the developing world. This morning I'd like to present uh, a piece of work that um, explores the potential of co-management as a governance framework to deliver more sustainable small-scale fisheries but also associated um, human well-being um, benefits across the developing world. So, Small-scale fisheries in the developing world are extremely diverse. Uh, they can range from fairly uh, low-technology, highly dispersed, multi-species reef fisheries, uh, such as those along the East African coast, which many of you know, um, to high-intensity, higher-technology inland fisheries of some of the great deltas in Asia, um, to the relatively more sophisticated marine fisheries targeting higher value marine products um, such as live reef fish fisheries um, across the Asia Pacific. They're also impacted by a range of drivers from within and external to the fishery itself. Um, and you'll be aware of many of these. We have heard about uh, many of them um, these past few days. Conventional fisheries management, which focused on single species and also single drivers, um, has therefore largely failed to um, deliver sustainable benefits from fisheries. Instead, the focus is shifting uh, to co-management approaches, which emphasize um, participation and collaboration between fishery stakeholders, um, but also with others outside the fishery where necessary. Um, the linkage functions of governance um, are expected to improve both the legitimacy and the knowledge base of management, so can contribute to improved compliance, uh, better problem solving, um, diffusion of innovation, all of which are really important for uh, these diverse and complex systems. Now, fisheries co-management has been mainstreamed through uh, policy and legislation in many developing countries, um, but we know relatively little about its impact on the ground. So uh, this talk will present uh, findings from a meta-analysis of existing data on the impact of um, small-scale fisheries co-management in developing countries um, to explore what we've learned from over 20 years of investment in this approach. So how did we go about this? Um, we first needed to identify relevant data. So we started with the definition of what we meant by fisheries co-management. Uh, for our purposes, it's the relationship between a resource user group and another organization or entity for the purposes of fisheries management in which some degree of responsibility and or authority is conferred to both parties. Now, under this definition, um, community-based resource management where government or non-governmental organizations support communities in fisheries management are included as examples of co-management. Second, uh, we did a broad sweep of uh, literature to find both published and unpublished literature relevant to small-scale fisheries and relevant to developing countries. We then subjected this potential um, sample of cases to quality control. Um, we identified over 209 potential case studies, and this slide shows their distribution uh, by region. 48% of them come from Asia and the rest are relatively um, evenly split between the Pacific, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. However, uh, on closer examination, 88% uh, of these cases did not have data that we could use for meta-analysis. Um, we were left with a sample of 28 case studies. Uh, however, some of them report on more than one site, and so where we could, we split data, um, and we have a sample of 46 uh, data points or sites. Uh, but 82% of these are based uh, in Asia. Uh, most of the data um, comes from qualitative perception analysis data, which is where fishery stakeholders are themselves asked to rank their perception of change over time along a defined scale. Um, and the remainder is, is made up of quantitative time series data of, of different sorts. Now, because of the range of indicators, but also the diversity in how data is um, collected, analyzed, and reported, uh, we had to code data to be able to compare across cases. So we use this very simple scheme. Um, basically, positive change is coded as a positive number, two or one. 
Negative change over time is coded as a negative number, and no change is coded as zero. Now, where change was found to be significant over time, it's coded as a two or a minus two, depending on the direction of the trend. And where data was not found to be significant, or where significance values were not reported in the literature, data is coded as one or minus one, depending on the trend. Um, we then evaluate the top 10 indicators which are most frequently used to assess impact of co-management in developing countries. Um, these can be categorized as process indicators and outcome indicators. Process indicators are those which are important for legitimate and effective implementation of co-management. Uh, and they include indicators such as how uh, participatory governance processes are, to what extent they can improve um, the influence of resource users over their fishery, um, and their control over the resources, um, and also to what extent co-management can improve uh, rural compliance and decrease conflict. Outcome indicators uh, instead measure um, the sort of final objectives of um, co-management in terms of uh, impact on both uh, fishery ecosystem and also fishery communities. Um, so they can include indicators of um, resource user access to their resources over time, um, but also fishery sustainability indicators such as resource well-being and fishery yield um, and indicators of human well-being um, through household well-being and household income. Uh, this um, graph shows the top five process indicators. Uh, the dark green is significant positive change over time. The red is the significant negative change over time. Light green and orange are the um, non-significant positive and negative change over time, and white is no change. Um, you can see that um, there is significant positive change in all the process indicators um, over time, which ranges from 46% of total for conflict um, to 73% of the total for influence over management processes. Um, this suggests that uh, overall co-management is achieving its linkage and community empowerment aims. Um, if we look at the top five <coughs> outcome indicators, you can see that there's much more variance in <clears throat> the direction of change over time for these indicators. Um, access to resources is the only indicator in which there is more negative change over time than positive. Um, and 33% of this is significant declines in access to resources. Uh, now, this data represents member-only data, which is um, data um, on the impact on those who experience co-management interventions directly. So here, um, members of uh, community groups and so on, um, which are part of co-management interventions, have declined access to their resources as a result of co-management interventions. Now, this um, suggests benefits for the sustainability of the fishery, um, but we need to analyze this indicator in the context of others uh, to understand its impacts on human well-being aspects of co-management. Um, now, fishery yield shows um, generally positive change over time. However, the significant change is evenly split between um, positive and negative. Um, resource well-being shows more positive, uh, significant change over time. And if we take these two indicators together, it suggests tentative improvements um, to fishery sustainability from co-management interventions. Similarly, if we take household income and household well-being, they suggest um, significant positive um, contributions from co-management um, to the human well-being aspects um, over time. However, there are factors which are completely unrelated to co-management interventions. So, for example, environmental factors or changing migration and remittance trends, which can impact some of these indicators, so yield and um, income. There are also different factors which are related to co-management, but which do not really reflect uh, improved governance. Um, so, for example, greater access to microcredit schemes um, or fish uh, stocking and enhancement. Uh, which again can infect, um, affect income and yield. Now, because this data is member-only data, we, don't, uh, we can't compare between those that are um, affected by co-management um, and those that haven't been. And so we can't solely attribute 
these trends in process and outcome indicators to the co-management project or intervention itself. So we do have a general positive impact from co-management interventions over time in small-scale fisheries. Um, but there are three different issues which um, mean we have to be cautious in how we interpret results. The first is the issue of bias. Um, there are three sources of bias which are well acknowledged in natural resource management assessments. Um, and that is the selection of um, sites of high potential for both implementation and evaluation. Uh, the higher reporting of successful cases and the non-reporting of failures. And also... Um, the evaluation of projects by both agencies and individuals who are usually involved um, in implementation in the first place. And these will generally skew results towards the positive uh, and are very hard to minimize um, when using existing data for analysis. Then we have this issue where we cannot compare treatment and control groups or member versus non-member, and so we cannot exclude other potential drivers um, of change. And then we have 45% of these cases coming from the Philippines. So to really understand to what extent um, we can generalize um, across developing countries, we would need to look at this again without the Philippines data set. So these are, again, the top five process indicators. And as you can see from existing data, we can say very little about the success of co-management governance processes um, across regions. All we can say is that data from the Philippines strongly suggests um, that co-management can be associated with um, positive trends in different process indicators. Similarly with the outcome indicators, uh, access to resources, resource well-being and household well-being are not well represented across regions. Um, fishery yield and household income are, however, more robust and are generally used in assessments um, to a greater extent across regions. They both confirm uh, positive trends over time, um, but very few cases actually report on significant change in either direction. So in conducting this study, uh, there were a few surprises to us. Uh, the first is that there is absolutely no ex post impact assessment data on fisheries co-management in developing countries. Now, these assessments would um, evaluate the impact uh, two to five years after a project's finished. And they're very important for understanding how sustainable impacts are, um, but also for capturing um, impacts that develop over time. So, for example, the benefit to communities from more sustainable fisheries are unlikely to be um, experienced within the relatively short project lifetimes of most co-management intervention projects. The relative lack of monitoring and evaluation data was also quite a surprise. Um, from 209 potential cases that claim to assess, evaluate, uh, review co-management in practice, uh, only 28 case studies um, had data that we could actually use for comparison purposes. And yet even from this, it's very difficult to make generalizations. First, because we cannot compare member and non-member data, um, so we can't exclude other potential drivers of change over time. Um, and second, because it's very difficult to generalize across regions um, when so much of the effort has been concentrated in the Philippines and in Asia in general. So this brings me to my take-home message, which is that um, co-management is still the primary approach in um, fisheries management across the developing world. Um, and to be able to understand how we can improve um, its contributions to sustainable development in these countries, we need to um, know what works and what doesn't in different contexts. Um, this requires uh, a greater investment and commitment to monitoring and evaluation in an impact assessment type research. I know it's not the most glamorous or interesting, but it is important. Um, and this is not just the case for co-management. Marine protected areas have received far more attention um, and there are a number of studies which evaluate their um, contributions to both conservation and as fisheries management tools. Um, but there are many other tools that we need to be able to use um, if we want to um, have effective sort of seascape level management um, that we need to learn more about. And these include adaptive management, integrated area management, and also ecosystem-based uh, management. The Coral Triangle Initiative, for example, 
um, advocates the ecosystem approach to fisheries as one of its main objectives for achieving um, conservation and food security aims in the Coral Triangle. And yet we know relatively little about what configurations and which management tools work best within this framework to actually achieve these different aims. I would just like to acknowledge um, Dimuk Pemzol and Nia Cherit, who worked on the meta-analysis with me, um, and others at the World Fish Centre in Penang, where a lot of the work was done. Um, and if I have time, I just want to be uh, a little bit cheeky and introduce some future work um, that would really benefit from the engagement of many of you in the audience. Um, we have this new project uh, starting uh, now on limits to climate change adaptation in the Great Barrier Reef, um, in particular looking at um, ecological, institutional, and economic limits to adaptation. Um, there's a three-step methodology. Uh, first, uh, we aim to develop some alternative scenarios based on different science around um, climate change impacts and adaptation. So we have two potential impact scenarios and two potential adaptation scenarios. And I will be getting in touch with many of you from the science community for input in this. Um, we then hope to take these two multi-stakeholder um, focus groups within the GBR um, to get a better understanding of how um, different stakeholder groups perceive climate change, um, but also their adaptation options and capacities. And we will end with a, a final workshop uh, which will invite policymakers and politicians um, in which we'll feedback um, results um, and create the space and time for these kinds of decision makers to discuss the issues and ideally uh, develop strategies for action that they can take back um, to their relative organisations. Now the details are not important for now. I just wanted to give you a heads up and I will be in touch with many of you um, to invite your participation and I hope you'll have the interest and time to do so. Thank you.